Welcome to Lord John Lander, the Outlander podcast for Lord John fans, where we talk all things Outlander, but especially about Jamie and his Sassanac. And sometimes we talk about Claire, too. We can't promise you much, but for the next half hour-ish, we can promise chaos and to make you question whatever life choices led you to listen to us. Before we get into it, this is your one and only warning that show and book spoilers are lurking around every corner. We're even going to spoil crap that never happened. Hello, I am Mistress Pandora, but you can call me Pan, because that's kind of a mouthful. And I'm Beth, otherwise known as JSweetPray747 on Twitter and JSweetPray on AO3. So we are going to go through episode 101 of Outlander, the series. We have all, of course, seen, we've both seen this, um, Beth, way more than I have. But we're going to, <laughs> we're going to go through and just take this. This is a good excuse for me to actually rewatch the series. Um and we're just going to kind of take each episode as we go. And we're going to talk about themes that stood out for us. Um, things that just made us think. Maybe some interesting tidbits. Occasionally facts that might be real. Don't trust a darn thing we say. Um, unless... Yeah, they, they really might not be real at all. Probably not. Um, this is satire, ladies and gents. This is satire. Um, but yeah, we're going to take this as much from a Lord John Central centric perspective as we can which sucks for the first two seasons but we're gonna try we can do we it can do there's it. plenty of there's plenty of real stuff about john and there's plenty of headcanon to uh go off of just consider us like the onion of outlander there we go i like it <laughs> <L'onion>. as... <laughs> so <laughs> yes so why don't we start with a synopsis? Like what's, what happens in 101? So the episode is really sort of broken out into two major parts. So we should probably take them kind of one at a time. Like and if you remember, yeah. And if you remember the first part of episode one is uh, Claire and Frank, they're on their honeymoon. They've spent what, six years apart, right? Something like that. Yeah. The whole, the duration of the entire war. Yeah, during World War II, Claire was an army nurse. Frank was some sort of spy or something. We'll get into that later. Um, and they're honeymooning in Scotland, which in the books is where they got, also where they got married. They don't really mention that in the show. Um, and the first thing that happens when they pull up is they see... Um, at the inn where they're staying, there's like blood <laughs> splashed across the doors, which is kind of weird. Um, but it's and anyway, sewing. The reason they're on this, it is, but like. It's unsettling. Just, it is. You know, I, yeah, I, I was thinking about this though. I think it would be more unsettling if it was just one house. True. <laughs> and and, it, and it's, the, it's the house you're staying right. at. It's just the one that would be concerning. <laughs> but it's everywhere. It's fine. <laughs> Clearly, it's okay, but I do like the way they kind of juxtapose it. The right, is it the right word? But they parallel the blood on the doors because it's Samhain, and it's the the saint thing. And yeah, sorry, I'm a bad pagan. It's the the saint thing, but it's right after we see Claire in the war. Right? Isn't isn't that how it opens up? Or yes, it opens up with her trying to keep somebody's leg attached to their body or something or the exact opposite of that one of the two oh uh, maybe i don't i don't really know <laughs> one or the other There's just a... she give it she take it right. away <laughs> but uh yeah it is kind of you know they're trying to get away from the war mm -hmm. they're trying to get away from all the blood and all of that and, and it's wiped on the they go to this place yeah yeah and uh, <laughs> yeah it's just just a, just a bit much and I was gonna say I probably should have looked up more about Samhain um in preparation for this episode but um we're just winging, we're winging it. it so we'll just move on from that um 
so the one of the reasons they're on this honeymoon is to reconnect. They haven't seen each other for six years. Um, I mean, they, a couple times, but not much. Mm -hmm. And Claire really wants Frank to put a baby in her, um, which, you know, good for her. <laughs> but, crazy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> insert tab A into slot B and repeat. <laughs> But if you think about it in this time, I mean, you know, it's it's the 40s, mid 40s. And even for someone as educated and worldly as Claire, she's married. So at this point in time, she doesn't really feel like probably that she can go back to work. Right. So what else to do but have a baby? Yeah. So there they are. Um, but Frank is more interested in other endeavors besides having sex with his wife like the reverend on their second honeymoon yes so he's uh he's into genealogy mm. is that what the That's kids are calling kids it, are calling it. <laughs> <laughs> jinx this, this didn't take long this didn't take long to go downhill at all <laughs> no so but he has this friend mm. who's a reverend They're just good friends it's um you know, they're like, you know, Bert and Ernie or, you know, Jimmy and John. just, just real. Yes. Aesthetic. Just, just friends. Very hundred percent platonic. Mm -hmm. Um, and so this reverend is some sort of, uh, Scottish historian himself. And he's got no, has all this information. So Frank's trying to figure out his genealogy. So most of the episode, instead of putting a baby in his wife, he's with the reverend going through his genealogy. Or jumping on the bed with her, which is doing it wrong. I, you know, it's not a very effective method. Mm -mm. Um, and, it is cute, you know, though. You just, it, I mean, he was, they were trying to just kind of break the ice, I think. Because the, the thing is, is that these two are just really sort of not connected anymore but he loves her um, so much yeah over this now? um <laughs> <laughs> i mean i think that they both love the idea of each other mm. and they love what they had before they were apart for so long um this feels like foreshadowing so they're true Mm, feels, could be. Does it feel like foreshadowing be. to you? It feels like foreshadowing to me. And it has nothing to do with the fact that I've read the entire series and watched all of the episodes. But, you know, it, it could be foreshadowing. No. It's probably related. No, nothing at all. So, but, you know, Frank's, um, they're, they're both, they, I think they've just grown apart. And, you know, they're trying to find their way back to each other. But, you know, not only, I think, is Claire sort of, um, it, kind of lost in, in the sense of not feeling connected to this man that she fell in love with. Um, but also, like I mentioned before, you know, she's been having this great adventure and she's a very independent person. And I'm, I'm sure she feels in some ways conflicted about settling down oh, yeah. and having a baby. And that's going to be her life, which brings us to the vase, mm. the vase. No vases so, when you're traipsing about the the world with your Uncle Lamb. No, Uncle Lamb. He's a good topic. He's a so, very good topic. You know, so she spent her childhood just sort of, you know, being a nomad and uh, traipsing around archaeology sites with Uncle Lamb, which, you know, seemed extraneous at the time. But when she became... You know, when she ends up in, spoiler alert, uh, the 1700s, <laughs> some of those skills really sort of, in case you didn't know, that's what happens, uh, you know, really sort of helps her um, be okay with adjusting to that more of a outdoorsy, no technology life. Well, yeah, well, especially because it was, you know, the, t the 20s and 30s, but also because we see 
in this episode that she spent her childhood drinking and smoking with her uncle. Um, True. And his... As one as does. As one does. Um, God, I forgot to get attacked. <laughs> as, <laughs> purity police, don't bother. We don't care. Um <laughs> As one does with your with your uncle and his mm, ostensibly his his faithful manservant that went everywhere, but I don't think so. I think Uncle Lamb and oh, what was his name? Was it? Uh, I can't remember now. I'm gonna look it up while we're talking. Okay. Anyway. Okay. Um, yeah, it's gonna be clacking on my keyboard. Sorry, not sorry. So, so be- while we're waiting for the name, so basically what you're saying is that Uncle Lamb and this manservant are lovers, just good friends. No, they're lovers, much like oh, okay, okay. We're just gonna we're gonna. I'm not it yeah. It. Hell yeah! <laughs> I pull zero punches. But I mean, yeah. I mean, Lamb is. It, it's very obvious. He's like 100 percent a gay man it's it's we love that for him but he 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 didn't really dote on her but it's clear that he really really cared about claire which was very fortunate for her because he had absolutely zero plans on having children and now he's got this aggrieved daughter all of a sudden right well and he tried to take her to the uh boarding school and she basically refused to get out of the car and uh since lamb was based it was a uh, conflict averse <laughs> he just said all right i guess you're coming with me kid true that is exactly how that happened oh i forgot okay i'm not finding i'm not finding his name um gosh darn it but he disliked hats on women Yes, which is also foreshadowing to much later in the series when uh, when the people on the ridge are trying to get Claire to wear a cap, and she says, I don't want to wear a cap. Well, no, but anyway, but I digress. Itchy. You don't blame her. Spoiler alert. Yeah. yeah. Too late. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> so here we have back to the honeymoon. Back to the honeymoon. That slight detour um, through the territory of Gay Uncle Lambert. Um, yeah. So it seems like what I, what I noticed when we were rewatching this um, the last time was Claire reaches out to Frank so much, and he's just like he's not getting it. He just seems kind of clueless that she's reaching out to him and i think it's really unfortunate because he does that really sweet thing where he's talking about drawing the lines on her palm um and then getting in trouble (laughs) just funny to imagine Um, (laughs) real funny to imagine and so it's like that really sweet thing but at the same time we know that when claire was at war she wasn't drawing pictures of frank's palm she was with daria she was yeah daria is a very important character that doesn't get talked about enough not nearly enough i mean she did she did her fair share of kissing other guys and stuff too but um the only one that she really connected with was another nurse in her unit Mm -hmm. named daria and um you know they were in love so you know she's got to be missing daria and uh but she's still making the effort to reach out to Frank. And like you said, he's, he's pretty obtuse. He's, not, he's just <laughs> he's not, not getting really it. Getting but that's it. gotta be really heartbreaking for Claire. If you think about it, because it was Daria's idea that she go back to him in the first place, because Claire was fully prepared to fake her death and run away with her. But Daria said, no, that's the wrong thing to do. Like she was too, she was too honorable for yeah. that. It just didn't sit right with her. So for her to go back to Frank and he acts like, you know, they're strangers, which, you know, they were because they were apart for five, six years. It happens. Um, but she's she's making all this effort and making all this effort. And he's just not, he's not picking up what she's putting down because he's, at this point, it really looks like he's only got eyes for the reverend. Yeah. And, you know, it's, 
it's interesting too because it's sort of foreshadowing for what's to come um you know in later seasons after Culloden as well um Claire as strong as a character she is tends to um you know in times of great crisis kind of rely on other people too you know especially her significant others to sort of guide her in in what to do make decisions for her kind of sort of yeah i don't even know if that's really true <laughs> no what we just but said it is sounded true. good let's go with it i mean it sounded really profound when i said it so i just <laughs> i just went for we'll it we'll explore that <laughs> as we go <laughs> yeah. yeah we'll explore that keep that in mind um yeah so you know trying to make a baby um well by jumping on the bed in theory so frank <laughs> and visiting the reverend so frank is but so while he's visiting the reverend though he seems like really obsessed with this ancestor of his captain jack yeah Wolf, that's kind of jonathan weird, wolverton it? randall it's a little well i mean you have this you have this kind of famous ancestor which, in my personal experience, the family legend tends to be more exciting than what you actually find on Ancestry.com. But considering this was the 40s, there was no Ancestry.com because there was no .com. So what he had was family legends that had been weirdly written down. So he is kind of strangely obsessed um, with locating this ancestor of his, who, of course, is going to play a very large part in Claire's life in the future past. Yeah, it's again, you know, it seems extraneous at the time, but it really kind of comes back around. You know, for being a Doctor Who fan fiction, it, the dots really do connect very well. Yeah, um, I agree. I mean, that's no shade I, on I, Doctor Who fan I, fiction I, at all. No, I've not read any of it except for this. <laughs> I was going to say, I don't actually know anything about Doctor Who, it, except that Outlander is a Doctor I Who I watched fanfic. Torchwood, which also has a Captain Jack, who I think is far superior to Captain Jack Randall. Um, and from what I've heard, yeah. Much, much superior, far less problematic. The character, anyway. So there's that. Uh, so, but I digress. So, but it is interesting. So I... I don't personally subscribe to this headcanon, but I have heard it said um, that Frank was maybe not as loyal to the allied forces as we would have, as we would be led to believe. I don't personally believe it. I like Frank. Yeah. Me being not a Frank fan, um, you know, I'm not saying that those rumors are true, but I am saying that we don't know what we don't know. And um, I think that, you know, it's just as likely that Frank was a Nazi or perhaps even working for the KGB. The KG was um, the KGB a thing at the time? It doesn't matter. Okay. Fair I enough. I mean, he could have like he could have just like invented the KGB for all we know. He was gone for six years I'm, being all secret. I'm not stuff. going to Google the history of the KGB because it is April, 2022. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. I'm not Googling it, but that isn't, that's probably a good, it's call. an interesting take that I completely disagree with. Uh, agree to disagree i mean and like i said it's i'm not saying it's necessarily true but uh yeah but he's such a you good just guy like know. frank had like he has his issues right like he has the temper and i'm gonna do that thing where i can't remember if it was the books or the show or both because i don't remember but there's a thing where he like he gets all angry and he like loses his temper he like trashes the reverend's garage he's always at the reverend's house always yeah there. that's yeah, it's kind of sus. I need that fic, um, people. I need that fan fiction. Please and thank you. I will read it and leave gushing comments. I promise. I don't think that's going to happen unless you write it's it. It's entirely you're, possible you're the, that I will write it because you're I write, the woman for this job. I write some heinous <laughs> crap. So 
cursed ship ahoy. <laughs> <laughs> Set sail. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's let's not go there quite yet. Okay, I can save it for later. That's fine. <laughs> no, it's it's no, it's good. Um, no, I was joking. It's all good. Um, no, I mean so. I think, so Frank in the beginning, I think, so here's my opinion. He's pretty dull. Um, He's not very attentive to his wife. They have not seen each other in six years. And uh, he's more interested in making out with the reverend. Um, Which is the opposite of dull, in my humble opinion. Listen... (laughs) It can be dull, okay? I mean, that's... <laughs> not if I wrote it. Not... Not... <laughs> it's very true. Confusing, maybe. You know what I was gonna... <laughs> um, yeah, very confusing. Um, I can't. Um... I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> You've just distracted me completely. Well, what I heard you saying before, calling Frank a Nazi of all things, is you don't see much difference between Frank and, and Black Jack Randall. No, so that's not true. I just and put again, all those words right into your mouth. <laughs> I didn't say he was a Nazi. I just said we don't know. And that it's just as possible. Mm. Um, but yeah, so he's kind of dull. He's obviously more interested in his, his reverend boyfriend um and i think too you know he's he's they so they got married he's like almost what 10 years older than claire or something, something like, that. like that yeah and and um you know i think that she did a lot of maturing in the six years um that they were apart where i think frank probably stayed pretty static and he's just not getting that like he's not seeing Claire for who she is now. He's just, I think he just wants things to go back to the way they were. And she was like 18 when she went into the war. Like that's a huge time for like personal growth. So I just think he's pretty obtuse. <laughs> and so I don't think he's. <laughs> yeah, this is a wonderful character analysis and, then, analysis and then. He's obtuse. <laughs> okay. I just, you know, and, and I think he's not as bad now as he gets pushed in some ways to be later. Mm. Um, but I don't think he's, I, I think there's more to Frank than anybody knows. And I don't think he's completely honest with Claire. I don't think he's, you know, completely, well, I know he's not completely in it 100% because he's, you know, got his side piece, the rev. So that's where I stand. But he's not like, I don't think he's like a sadistic. He's you not know? a rapist is what you're saying. That's, that's not trip over that yeah. bar. Okay. <laughs> Anyway, so we've spent way we've too spent much time on so Frank. much time on Frank. So one of the things that I think we see in this first part of the episode, and then we can maybe try to, maybe we could try to steer this dumpster fire to the 1700s. Um, <laughs> no promises. Um, so one of the things that I noticed in the first part of this episode is how heavy the symbolism really is. Like, I mean, just laying it on thick. So we've got. The way the colors are um, kind of muted in the 40s, the way the color red kind of stands out but doesn't. And there is this interesting tidbit, and I think I remembered where it was from. I think it was actually from the the Outcast podcast um, that I heard this, but I don't know. I don't remember. I have the mind of a sieve. But they specifically the color red that appears in the first season at least is very specific so the the red coat uniforms are not quite right they're actually a little bit i kind of i pulled this up on google and kind of compared and contrasted and they're actually a little bit bluer um which is a makeup artist term sorry um 
they're a little bit of a bluer, richer no, red, you know, it. as opposed to less fire engine kind of orangey red. Um, mm-hmm. So it's kind of an interesting, they're a little bit, a little bit bloodier in, in appearance. Honestly, if you think about like how dark red or like arterial blood is. But then we also have, of course, a very explicit symbolism of Mrs. Graham reading Claire's palm and the tea leaves, um, which let's just telegraphing that right there. Um, I mean, she basically tells the whole story. This is what's going to happen. (laughs) Mrs. Graham should come with a spoiler alert, though I love her. Um, (laughs) That's whatever. And then the the vase, which sounds awkward coming out of my redneck mouth, but the vase um, that she didn't buy that represents her nomadic lifestyle. And boy, does that not change. Um, And interestingly, though, in the book, she does buy the vase. Mm-hmm. That's right. So that's like one of the kind of key differences between the book and the show is that, it, and not that it ends up really matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but like, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it, it's kind of interesting that she, she's, she's very hopeful that she's going to settle down and have, you know, a quiet life. But but when you think about it, would she really have been happy with that? I don't think no, so. No, probably not. She likes drama too much. <laughs> she does love her drama. Said that out loud. And as we'll soon find out, she loves her buff Scottish men too. Wouldn't I mean? It's a yeah. I mean yeah. It's a thing. That's I think a good segue. That's a into great segue. So speaking of Claire continually reaching out to Frank and him just not getting it, she invites him to come pick flowers at Credna Dune, <laughs> which sounded to me like that's what the kids are that's calling, what the kids it, are calling it these days. It sounded to me like, hey, let's get naked and romp in the heather, is what I heard. But you know, I'm apparently mm-hmm. not married to Claire. Um and so then there's that really traumatic, like buzzing and screaming. And then she wakes up after this strange little flashback to the car crash um, that she was in at some point in the past. So she has no bearing point. on anything else. Um, and then she wakes up and she's on what she thinks is a movie set involving red coats and guns. And obviously the best thing to do is to run. And, you know, going back to the colors... It's no wonder she thinks she's on a movie set because it is suddenly everything is in technicolor. It's in technicolor. It is like <laughs> the Wizard of Oz. Yeah, it's like the Wizard of yes. Oz. Like she's she's clearly not in Kansas anymore, except she kind of is. <laughs> but not. I oh God, the time travel it hurts. Yeah. The time travel hurts my head. It does so much. It does. It is a flat circle, um, but also kind of a spiral. <laughs> And here we go, around and around. And also a loop. And a loop. <laughs> but not a loop. And a loop, but not a loop. It's a squiggly. It's a squiggly bit. Um, so she immediately... It's Jeremy Barramy. <laughs> so she immediately meets Black Jack Randall, which is a fantastic introduction. Welcome to the 18th century. Here's a horrible person. Um, but she thinks it's Frank because Tobias Menzies is amazing and can play two characters completely distinctly. Yeah, he's he's just incredible. And, you know, I think part of the reason why he uh, causes such, you know, visceral reaction as Frank and Black Jack Randall is a credit to Tobias Menzies and his acting. Absolutely. Um, He's just and you know, I remember the first time I watched this, I I actually when he turned around, I was like wait, that dude looks like that other dude, but is it the same part? Like he, he, it, it almost was like, I mean, he became a different dad. Like he's wearing Frank's face, but it's not Frank. And you can really see that in the way Claire just immediately goes, you're not Frank. No, madam, I am not. (laughs) Isn't that like a Nick Cage movie or something? Face off? Face off. Yes. (laughs) Cool. The original face the original. off. So uh, yeah, we've we've just Scotland. been we've just dated ourselves. <laughs> but yeah, so that's all right. And then of course he immediately um, attacks her, as one does. Apparently, calls her a whore. Calls her a whore. To rape her. Uh, it's classy, classy guy. Um, but Myrta, of course, 
saves her. Yes. We, we stand Marta. Oh my God, I love Marta so much. Uh, he's, he's, he's a best. whole mood. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not going to get into it because um, the best Myrta scenes are in season two. Season. Yes, absolutely. Um, and what, what, what was I just going to say? Oh, in the, in the graphic novel, The Exile, um, we find out that Myrta actually saw Claire uh, arrive through the stones. Really? I need to so find he that kind novel. of is like, yeah. So he kind of, he's kind of been new like the whole time, <laughs> and so why does he get all pissed and... off? And... Okay, never mind. <laughs> I don't know. We're I gonna mean, have to dissect that later. It's time travel. Put a pen in it. Nothing has to make That's sense. That's true. <laughs> Um, so yeah, Marta saves her. Yeah, and uh, takes her to this uh, really smelly cottage where there's like just a lot of testosterone and stanky and men. men just free balling <laughs> with their kilts. So <laughs> built in air conditioning. There's just I just just a lot of male smells. Mm. I, I imagine and plus the blood. Um, like they're mostly going. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. mostly Jamie that's covered in blood, which is kind of. That sets the stage for most of the series. He's usually covered in blood. And Claire is usually saving his ass. Putting him back together like the repair person that she is. <laughs> She's not a <laughs> nurse. She's a mechanic. <laughs> she wants under that hood. That didn't make any sense. How did <laughs> And I just go with go it. With it it. It's cool. You know, what else? What else? It's cool. So I do. Uh, um, it is really striking there when so when she's like cussing up a storm and like taking command of this group of heavily armed, very large, stinky men. Um, he gives her the most who don't speak her language. don't speak her language other than they know. Well, they do, but they're not. They know fucking son of a bitch, but they don't really understand who Roosevelt is or why that's now Jesus's middle name. Um, they haven't figured that one out yet. No. That will remain in mystery. Yes, but um, Jamie's, like, gives her these, like, really striking hard eyes. Like, can we just take a moment to appreciate the range of Sam Hewen's hard eyes? He's He's got, like, like bright heart eyes and, like, angry heart eyes and like sad heart eyes <laughs> like he's got the full range he really does of heart eyes and we see it i mean obviously directed at claire but also at john later um mm. getting ahead of ourselves but we should actually take a moment and set the scene here so at this point in in the series obviously this isn't this is tragically not covered in the books or the show but at this point lord john gray is 14 years old um, as far as we know, he's still living in Aberdeen, um, probably trying to act all mature and impress the boys, right? Mm -hmm. But secretly catching. He's kind of miserable. Yeah, well, of course, like his father died two years ago, which is why he's in Aberdeen because and you know his his older brother is now the head of the head of the family, um, and there's scandal because his father died under um, mis. Seriously tragic, scandalous circumstances. We can maybe save that because we're gonna have to milk the storyline for a few episodes. Uh yeah, <laughs> yeah. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more. I mean, yeah. Um, but yeah, he's uh, his mom's in France. Mm -hmm. He's he's there. How's like in London trying to rebuild the regiment know. and you know, kind of trying to save the family name? Yeah, like jackass. I think he, it's. I, I always forget. Is he still married to his first wife at this point? I think so. I think. Yeah. 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 Because because it's shortly after. Soon she'll die. She's probably cheating uh, on him as we're recording this. With twelve trees. <laughs> <It's lit. laughs> yeah, and uh, so that's interesting. And then we can, you know, again save this for another episode, but we can talk about. You know, when he meets his second wife, who is the coolest fucking 
Um, God, I, I love her so that. much. I don't know. I don't see why not. We're going to call it explicit so cool. anyway. <laughs> like, I want to be her. Um, honestly, both Minnie and uh, John's mom, Benedicta, like, Ugh. they are, like, honestly, hands down, the coolest female characters in the entire they series. Are the best female uh, characters. They're so awesome. They need and so much more. They they need screen time. Full stop. Like need them on the screen. This is absolutely why we need a Laura John spinoff because we well, need them. I mean, you know, what's her face is writing a prequel to uh, the, the books about um, <laughs> about Jamie's parents, which is we've already heard that story like fourteen thousand times, um, and you know probably a prequel about any other character would be more interesting than that. But I digress. Um, <laughs> but like, I mean, Benedicta, she needs, she's been, she's, she's on, she's her second husband has just died. Mm-hmm. Um, and she goes on to marry again later, but we'll talk about that later. Um, and she's just cool as fuck. God, she's so cool. She's just like, like if she were alive today, uh, she she first of all she would have been uh, like a hippie. I'm I'm convinced. Like she would have been like mm-hmm. social justice fighter. Mm-hmm. Like you know, um, and she'd probably just like wear like a leather jacket and ride a motorcycle and oh, shit. Yeah, badass lover. All right. I'm getting lost in my That's thoughts. okay. <laughs> Benedicta thoughts are always good thoughts. Benedicta and Minnie always get a pass. Uh, they they deserve like a Thelma and Louise style adventure story. Yeah. Right? Like, how cool would that be? I love it. Anyway. So that's where John is. So back to the hard eyes, because we will see Jamie's hard eyes again later. Um, yes. As, as he gazes upon the wonder that is Lord John and who wouldn't. Um, so yeah, hard eyes at Claire while she's patching him up, cussing up one side and down the oh, other. Also, also hard eyes at her breasts when she says she's a nurse. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's also got part of his range of hard eyes is the the boobs are her eyes. Completely like, understandable. He's got a special heart eyes for boobs. Don't we all? I, I mean, I get it. I, I do. You know. <laughs> Don't we all? I mean, <laughs> but it just adds to, you know, his his range. Do you think that's why uh, he keeps repeatedly injuring himself throughout this ride back to Leoc? Because she just keeps ripping strips off of her dress. At some point, she's just going to be stark naked. <laughs> I hadn't thought about that angle you know, before, but it's not a bad angle. I mean, hey, if it works. <laughs> you know, Jamie is a virgin, uh, mm. supposedly. Well, just I mean. not counting certain experiences, I think. Right. Well, he doesn't think that his time with Pierre counts, but I mean, we know it does. But of course. He, he's, he's still kind of inexperienced. We right? can't grant him that. So he has. And regardless, he doesn't really have a lot of game yet. So, yeah, that could very validly be his game. Like, I don't know what else to do, so I'm just going to keep getting this woman to patch me up and get herself naked in the process. I mean, I'm going to throw my, throw you over my shoulder and carry you is good game. Mm, mm, it's true. I, I, I it's true. suddenly was Katniss in uh, The Hunger Games. I volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know why she said no. I don't know why. You know, she, I'm convinced she only said no because of that bum shoulder. She didn't want to screw it up more, which, okay, fine. She spent all that time putting it back together. We do have a very important um, topic to talk about, though. Mm. Um, and, that, and that is the introduction of the Jamie Fraser erection scale. Um, so Doesn't get enough screen time. <laughs> It doesn't. It doesn't. It's in. The, it's like all in the books. So in the books, he says when Claire hops up on that horse with him the first time, uh, she's. It, no, it's from her perspective, mm-hmm. and she says she's. At first, she's worried that he is um, 
overexerting him, himself and pre just pretending to feel better, but he's really still hurting. But then uh, she feels a little pokey pokey in her back and she realized he's probably, probably, probably fine. doing okay. He could also be 23 and she's half naked and hot. You know, he could actually and... have lost a limb and be bleeding out <laughs> and still be okay in that department. But again, not enough screen time. For this particular you know, event, um, which is just a damn shame. So what do we say on a scale of one to five penis? <laughs> I was not prepared for you to say that. <laughs> well, you know, there is a lot of, there, there was some, a little bit of blood loss happening here, right? Like not a lot, but a little, because most of that blood wasn't his, I think were his words. Um, mm, so probably, that's hot. probably it is grubs up good uh probably two out of five penises penises okay that's fair that's fair what would you say um i would say so as far as we know it's been a while since he's had any uh contact with his anyone other than his hand penis <laughs> yeah um, which I, you like said it like they're not on speaking terms. <laughs> like, you're getting me in trouble, man. <laughs> we, we gotta keep doing this. So, he does. He does have a lot of Catholic guilt about it, and he calls it abusing himself. Which that's that's we don't have time. We're to not going to unpack, unpack that, that today, today, but we will mark my words. We will. We will. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know. So I'm, I'm going to say a three, three penises, three penises. Okay. because, because, you know, this is pretty, I think it's a pretty significant, it's a, know, it's a significant boner for him. It's a boner it of is. extreme importance. I think it, it makes him start to <laughs> notice the scary, angry, sweary lady. Um, it's true. I, I think at some point we're going to have to unpack his, um, his uh, kink for uh, screamy, scary ladies and where that stems from. But it doesn't go cool away. <laughs> I'm not going to Freud this. I'm not, I'm not looking for mommy issues on this one. That is a bridge too far for me. For now, I can probably get there with a little mental prep. I can get there. And, and more alcohol. Yes, definitely. Because that... Yeah, definitely. That's going to happen. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So she patches him up. He gets hurt again after he throws her off the horse as they approach mm, the name of the rock that has the word cock in it. But it the means means rooster. Cock namen. <laughs> um, sorry, Scottish people. I apologize. I'm going to insult an entire country and not actually mean to. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, so... They, she says something about didn't the the British use that for ambush? And then of course Dougal is super suspicious because she's British and talking about British troop movements. And then she gets thrown off the horse. Yes, because they were getting attacked. Oh, yeah, not because like Dougal didn't just like push her off because he was suspicious. No, Jamie pushed something. her off. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> also fair play, which. <laughs> Yes, uh, you know, um, yeah, so she gets pushed off, she starts to run away, and that's when we we get back to uh, throwing her over his shoulder. We came full circle on that one. We did. We took the long way, but we did it. <laughs> you know, if you don't take the long way, it's just not fun. Well, they're taking the long way, they're on horseback. That's true. Yeah. So it's fair. you know what I you know what I <clears throat> you know what I find really interesting um, in both the show and the books is like how like you know sometimes it seems to take forever mm -hmm. for them to go like I don't even know how far and then other times like you know Ian will walk from like you know. Virginia to upstate New York in like two weeks. <laughs> like a week. I'm just 700 miles. I'm just, 
I'm just just throwing that out there. The that fucking woods. I don't think this travel is to scale. If, you know, if we could insert chapter breaks in our own personal lives, you know, we could solve the traffic problem. <laughs> if we could just, if we could just scene break, have that That's that fun right. little montage, getting ready for work in the morning, and then scene break. I'm at work. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I wish well I mean I work from home now so I mean that's basically what happens <laughs> I mean me too I'm like ah well I guess I'm <laughs> traffic on the stairs this morning was just brutal sorry boss uh, yeah so how I managed to be late I don't know I do it all but anyway <laughs> I really digress I, I, really I mean digress. yeah I would too if I continued to comment on that because I'm the same yeah so as going back to the way things kind of relate between all of this extraneous detail that we're getting in the 40s that would be the 1940s um is coming back to her in little pieces and um it is becoming strangely helpful as she proves herself yeah. even more suspicious, even though she's trying to prove herself helpful. But, you know, Dougal's kind of a suspicious bastard. Don't blame him. I would be too if I were that much of a Jacobite at the time. Um, but yeah, so they ride a couple of days in the cold and the rain at night to get to Castle Leoc. And then she has a flashback, but it's not really a flashback because it's only back to her and it's forward for everyone else. And time travel hurts my head. Ugh, I got a headache. I'm now. sorry, <laughs> but it was it was kind of important because she and Frank visited Castle Leoc and you know, yes, did the the unsanitary oral sex in the surgery that she doesn't know that's what Ugh. that was. Um, I would not have sat on that I table don't know. without underwear. I, I am no, I mean it's gross, and I am I am not a prude, okay, but. <laughs> In the book, it's she makes it very clear later on that Frank has never uh, done that. Um, so why add it in this dirty castle? I mean, she's a nurse; she knows it's unsanitary. I don't know. It just seems. But it's hot, weird. Beth. Mm. You just don't like. I don't Frank. think you any... just don't want Frank to have. It's fun. true. It's That's true. If it were Jamie, I'd be like, you know, yes, more. But um, yeah, I just don't find anything sexy between them hot. Yeah. More for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, so they show up at Leoc mm -hmm. and uh, that's where the episode ends. Yeah. So that's that's where we are. So one of the things um, that we kind of wanted to do, uh, we may not be able to do it for every episode, but we did want to recommend a fan fiction that kind of at least tangentially relates to the episode that we just watched. So a good one for this episode um, would be anything World War II, right? Yep. And um, <clears throat> I could have looked up, I know I've read several world war ii mm -hmm. ones um and i was just too lazy to look them up uh um, she has more flashbacks we can always one, plug them later <laughs> that's true but one of my favorites is when the world is free by precious little ingenue it is a um world war ii au um where uh uh, Jamie uh, and Claire are a couple. Um, Jamie is fighting in the war and he's best friends with John. Uh, there's some tension there. Um, and this is not a spoiler. This happens right in the beginning. Um, Jamie is killed um, and uh, it, Claire finds out that she's pregnant and so John marries her to protect her because Jamie asked him to take care of her. And that's all I'm going to tell you uh, because there's lots of surprises and um, lots of twists and 
lots of uh, good smut. Mm, very, very good well smut. written as well. Um, as always, if you mm -hmm. go check this out on AO3, please read the read the tags, heed the tags. They're there for your protection. <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. Um, this fic is not for everyone, though it should be. There's but, some reason you know, why it can't people... be, but everyone has preferences, and that is a good thing. It's That is okay. Um, you you're entitled to your wrong opinion, but <laughs> anyway, all right. Have we reached the end? I think we have stretched the limits of what half an hour ish actually entails. <laughs> I don't even want to know. Uh, I don't even want to know. Don't worry about it. <laughs> we'll take, we'll take, <laughs> oh geez. Hey, I have editing to do. It's fine. It's okay. It'll be hard to fill an hour. It, uh, no. it would be. Oh, apparently not. No, apparently not, because we can anyway. just gab about whatever <laughs> and make shit up as we go. Uh, Anything goes. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and we will talk to you next time. If you're still sticking around. <laughs> if you haven't completely given up. <laughs> if you made it through this Congratulations. <laughs> go get a cookie. <laughs> All right. Bye. bye. This podcast is not affiliated with Outlander, Sony, Stars, and definitely 100% not with Diana Gabaldon. All opinions expressed are our own, and we may not even believe them ourselves. In fact, nothing in this podcast should be taken seriously as a general rule. We may not even be real people. Does this podcast even exist? This podcast is not suitable for children, immature adults, homophobes, anyone who takes fandom too seriously, people who don't understand that the characters aren't real, people with sticks up their ass, people who hate fun, and people who have no sense of humor. Do not try any of these hot takes at home. We are professionals. The FDA has not approved this podcast for human consumption. Side effects may include nausea, vomiting, the urge to send us anonymous homophobic hate, ringing in your ears, and constipation. If you experience any of these side effects, ask your doctor if dying mad about it is right for you. If you know us in real life, no, you don't. <laughs>